Mismantle Chronicles, Book 1, Urchin of the Riding Stars, by M. A. McAllister. Prologue. On the island of Mismantle, before dawn, on an autumn morning, a squirrel lay on her side and watched the shooting stars dash across the sky. It took her mind from the pain. It was a rare night indeed when the stars left their orbits and swirled so low across the sky that it seemed you could reach up and touch them. These nights did not happen often, and when they did, they always meant that a great event would happen, for good or for bad. Nobody could know which, even old brother Fur watching from the highest turret in Miss Mantle Tower didn't know. The mother squirrel didn't know, and didn't care. She lay panting, longing for help with a long, hard birth. But she was a stranger here, and knew nobody. Her own island was far away, and she hadn't dared to stay there. A prophecy had been made about this baby. He will bring down a powerful ruler. If the king had heard that, he surely would have had the baby killed, being ruthless enough to do it. She had hidden on the first trading ship she could find, and escaped. She had hoped that the ship would go to Mismantle. She had heard great things about the secret land, where the ki kind king ruled from a high tower on the rocks, and red squirrels, hedgehogs, moles, and otters lived and worked together. It was a good safe place, protected by the enchanted mists, folding around it like a cloak. Because of that protection, very sh few ships ever reached the island, but at last, this one had. Already in birth pain, she had slipped from ship to shore and crawled to the shelter of the rocks. No creature was near. Those who were awake were high on the hilltops watching the stars. A sudden spear of pain made her lurch and gasp, and but it took her breath away so completely that she could not even scream. Birth should not be like this. Something was terribly wrong and she was alone. Raising her head, she could see lights shining high in the mismantled tower, but it was far away, soaring towards the night sky. As stars swirled over the island, the squirrel's baby slithered into the world, a pale scrap of a thing with thin downy fur which glimmered under the starlight. With the greatest effort she had ever made in her life, the mother sat up, nuzzled him, and bit through the cord. Heart keep you, she whispered, and laid the warmth of her face against him. Be happy. May someone find you and love you. Before she could give him a name, she was dead. The baby lay on the shore, pale as moonlight, showing up clearly against the dark rocks. A gull flying overhead caught sight of something like a scrap of fish, swooped down, snatched him up, and rose into the sky. Miss Mental Tower was near, and that would be a place to perch and gobble down the meal. In a dash of silver, a star rush, rushed past, and another. The goal swerved and soared, a falling star dazed it, and another made it veer from its course. Scared and angered, it opened its beak to screech. The newborn baby fell, spinning, gaining speed. If he had hit the rocks, he never would have breathed again. But he fell into shallow water, and the waves washed him onto the cold, wet sand. In mismantled tower, animals had crowded around the windows all night to watch the stars. The best was over now, and they were smothering their yawns with paws and settling into their nests for a brief sleep. But in the highest turret of all, Brother Fur remained watching, leaning his paws on, to, on the sill to ease his lame leg. The squirrel priest was old, but his eyes were still sharp, and he missed nothing. When he saw something white tumble from the sky, he leaned out to see better. Sometimes fragments of rock would fall to the earth as the stars passed, and it could be one of those. Below, from another window, Crispin stretched forward and turned his face to the sky. It was a young squirrel living in the tower, an attendant to the hedgehog King Brushin. Though he was young, he had just made a, been made a member of the circle, a small group of animals closest to the king. He craned his neck from the window, when he too saw something white spinning down through the air. He leaped from the window and ran swiftly down the wall to the shore. In the dim early light, Crispin knelt by the thing at the water's edge. He had expected something hard and bright, like a precious stone, but we found was a curled up scrap that could be anything. A starfish? It moved. As Crispin watched, it gave a thin cry and curled and waved a tiny paw in the air. Crispin heard the shuffling step of Brother Fur behind him, but was too fascinated to look around. It's a baby, he said. Well, heart blessed, so it is, said Fur. Pick it up, young Crispin. Don't leave it there. Crispin wasn't used to babies. He scooped it up awkwardly with two paws, afraid of hurting it, but it stretched and wriggled, and without thinking, he cradled it against the warmth of his shoulder. Brother Fur took off the old gray cloak he wore. 
You young squirrels don't feel the cold. You're always going out without your cloaks. Wrap him in that before he freezes. How did he get here? Crispin wondered aloud, watching the baby's face as he wraps the cloak around it. He must be very new. A few hours old, I think, said Fur. And most unusual, look at that fur. Crispin didn't know what newborn babies were supposed to look like, but he knew there was something strange about this one. It was paler than the sand. We need to find its mother. She must be worried. She must be dead, said Fur bluntly, or dying, or she's rejected it. A mother from her baby, if separated from her baby, would be screaming to uh, split the rocks. She'd have the whole island out looking for him. Crispin handled the ba handed the baby to Fur, ran around the shore to find a group of otters, and sent them to search for the baby's mother. He returned to find a chubby female squirrel bounding rather, rather heavily down the beach, and even in the distance he could hear her calling to Fur. What you found, she bellowed. A one of them stars? Crispin flinched. Apple was a warm-hearted squirrel, but not very bright, and extremely talkative. Morning, Brother Fur, sir. Oh, morning, Crispin. I've come looking for stars, or I mean, bits of stars. I've been up in the tree all night watching them stars. Don't know what bits of stars look like when they're on the beach, but I came looking all the same. You found one? Better than a star, said Fur. He lifted back the corner of the cloak, and the baby blinked in it sleepily. A baby? Apple's deep brown eyes widened. Ooh, can I have a little hold? Crispin thought that might be a good idea. Might not be a good idea. But Fur handed her the baby. She made little comforting noises to it and nestled in her fur. Who's is he? She asked. He's lost, said Fur. Who's washed up in the sea? We're looking for his mother. If you can't find her, I'll have him, she said promptly. I don't mind. I'll take care of him. I love babies, me. Thank you, Apple, said Fur as he took the baby back. We'll take him to my turret to warm him by the fire. Will you find a nursing mother who can feed him in case his own can't be found? I'll look after him, called Apple over her shoulder as she hopped away. Don't, don't let her near him, said Crispin. She doesn't know her teeth from her tail tip. She'd forget where she left him. She's a motherly soul, said Fur, and she wouldn't bring him up alone. There's a whole colony of squirrels in Anemone Wood, all bringing each other up. They're capable of raising one extra youngling between them, and they cope well enough with their own. You seem to have survived. They began the long walk to the tower. Crispin would rather have skimmed up the walls, but he slowed down to keep pace with Fur. You told her he was washed up by the sea. Hmm, I certainly did, said Fur. He must be an orphan and not from here. We'll take... We've never had a squirrel that color before. That makes him different enough from the other squirrels. Without them thinking, he came tumbling down from the sky on a night of riding stars. And if I know Apple, she'll soon forget that we had anything to do with him. Let her think that she found him herself. We'll tell him all he needs to know when the time is right. They stopped by a window so that Fur could ease his lame leg and get his breath back. And Crispin looked down the tide line. It was scattered with all sizes of shells, colored pebbles, driftwood, shining clusters of seaweed, tattered feathers, and spinny shells of sea urchins. Urchin, he said. Can we call him Urchin? He was found on the shore. Fur raised a paw. May the heart bless you and keep you, Urchin, Miss Mantle, he said. And, so, uh, and far away on the other side of the island, a wave of the sea lifted Urchin's mother, cradled her, and carried her gently away.